shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters Podcast Special Edition. It's that time of year again, and we just wrapped up a Cincinnati Comic Expo. This is always a fun weekend. Tom and I love getting together and going down to this thing. This year was no exception. Uh, we typically only go down and spend the day Saturday, but I had to sneak down Friday night. There was a couple panels I wanted to try to get to. I wasn't sure if I was going to get to the first one, which was the Q&A with Brent Spiner. But as it turns out, I was able to get in there, and I got to hear him talk. Sort of. Yeah, unfortunately, I did try to record it so I could share a few excerpts with you, but... Uh, I don't know. The audio just wasn't working uh, for him. Uh, I don't know if it is the, the volume just wasn't turned on or... I'm not sure. It just nothing really came out that was any good. It was, you know, Brent Spiner. If you, anyone has seen Brett Spiner at a convention, that's exactly what you got. He is a showman, absolutely. But what I really wanted to catch was the Q&A that came directly after. The one and only Mr. Paul Williams was at the Comic Expo. Now, if you don't know who Paul Williams is, well, you probably do know. You just don't know by name. He has written so many songs that you have I guarantee you no matter how old you are you've grown up with he has worked with everyone from the Carpenters to Daft Punk <laughs> and he had some fantastic stories to tell of his acting career his uh, singing and songwriting career and that's where I want to jump into his Q&A the moderator asked him a question about him working with such a a wide, vast array of artists. And this was Paul's answer. Paul, you've worked with a wide array of uh, artists. Uh, Jim Henson and the Muppets, uh, the Carpenters, Three Dog Night, up into uh, Portugal the Madness recently, and Daft Punk. Um, what's the process of writing for such a wide array of uh, genres of music? You know, it's like getting on an elevator and talking to a stranger. You never know what's going to come out. You know, like you may get this, you know, a dead silence, you know, or, or what you may get is, you know, it's, it's, it, it depends a lot. It de obviously depends on, on the people and the combination. It's always different. Oh, the, the way I wrote before I got sober is a little different than the way I, I right now, and the way I right now is I just, you know, I just try to get out of the way. Uh, writing with, the, when I first started out, I wrote a lot with a, with a guy named Roger Nichols, and Roger Nichols would write the, the melody, you know, da ba dee da dee da ba da da you know, every, and, and, and I would say, Can I, how, what do we do? I want to add a little note there, can we do da 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 and he'd say, no. <laughs> I don't think so. And he was 6'5", and I'm 5'2", he shrank and surfing and go, he said, no, it's fine, just like that, you'll find it. So I would write, talking to myself and feeling old, so it was, it was, a, it, in a way, the first guys that I wrote with were my, kind of, my music school, you know. The other thing that people need to realize is that as for an out-of-work actor, I did really well and, and was very lucky with music. When I started writing songs, I had just done two movies then, uh, and I couldn't get arrested. I mean, I was maybe 20, 27 when I started writing. Uh, the last movie I did it was a movie called The Chase with Marlon Brando, Robert Redford, uh, Jane Fonda, and, and uh, I looked like a kid until you put me next to a, a real kid, then I looked like a kid with a hangover. <laughs> and, uh, and I just couldn't get arrested. But on the set of The Chase, I, I was sharing a dressing room with a kid that had a really nice guitar. And I picked it up and he went, don't touch that guitar, it's a Martin. I, went, I didn't know they had names. You know. <laughs> uh, but I went out and I bought a little guitar and there was a scene where Robert Redford is hiding in a jungle that we just set fire to, these four kids in the jalopy in the movie. And 
I don't know why, I have no idea why this came out of me, but I'm sitting there on the steps in front of the, of our little, tiny little dressing room, in the middle of the night, shooting this scene, and they're taking a break, and I just went, Bubba, 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 come out wherever you are, and we're gonna come in and get you, yes, we're gonna come in and get you. I just made it up, it was just, I don't know why, but Robert Duvall was walking by. You don't all know who Robert Duvall is, an amazing actor. And he said, what is it? I said, it's a guitar, I just bought it. He said, no, not the guitar, but you were singing. I said, I just made it up. He said, come with me. You walked me over to the director, Arthur Penn, he said, show him. I said, it's a guitar, I just bought it. <laughs> Jesus, not the guitar. Show him that little song. And I thought, I am in trouble. I mean, I just, maybe you're not allowed to make stuff up, you know, on um, while you're working. But I went, bub, 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 come up, whatever you are, I sang it for it. And he went, light him up, boys. And so, boom, they turned on the gas, and they lit the, the, the grave, the, uh, the junkyard. And I said, okay, so now just go stand there by the barbed wire and sing it. Then he had to get in the back of the, the jalopy and sing it all. And it's in the movie. And you know, I, when I first got sober, a woman was talking to me about billboards, you know. You, in your life, you've got to watch for billboards. That was a billboard. That was the big amigo saying, you know what, this is not really the thing, the work you need to be doing right now, but that songwriting thing, that just might work for you, and it, and it turned out. It's just, and it's always different. I mean, I just played uh, Hollywood Bowl with, with Portugal the Man. We did the uh, full house. They put in a full house. We're writing together, Daft Punk, uh, Grammy for Album of the Year when I was 74. That doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen. Uh, I wrote two songs last time on it. I have to tell you that, that what changed in my life 33 years ago is I quit trying to, to run this show. And I, and I turned it over on a daily basis. I get up in the morning and I say, lead me where you need me. You know, uh, surprise me, God. It's my birthday. We do it a day at a time. <laughs> And uh, it, everything got better. Everything got better. I love that story. I love how he just stumbled into songwriting. <laughs> he, he went from a, a, a nearly out-of-work actor to one of the most famous songwriters of the 20th century. I jumped in line to ask a question, and I was kind of hoping for a very interesting, you know, one of those behind the scenes, you never would have heard it anywhere else sort of story. Didn't quite get what I was expecting. Good time for one more question. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming out and joining us. Uh, this is definitely going to be a highlight hearing your story, so I was really thrilled that you've come back to visit us. Uh, my question is about a uh, independent film that you got involved in several years ago called The Ghastly Love of Johnny X. And I was really curious how you got involved in that. I was asked if I would do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I've always been better at showing off than showing up. I mean, I just, you know, I love to act. I just, you know, I've always approached songwriting, especially the songwriting for a film or, or a, you know, a, a play or anything. Uh, and incidentally, Emmett Otter's Jugman Christmas, which opened to rave reviews in New York, was closed by, uh, by COVID, like everybody else was. Opens this fall at, at the uh, Studebaker in Chicago uh, with a whole new cast and all. So it's, it's back and, and uh, but I've always approached writing for those uh, as an actor. I mean, uh, the, probably the best example of that is when, one of the things I'm most proud of I ever did that got the worst reviews ever in the history of filmmaking is, is Ishtar. I wrote, the, I, approached, I wrote the songs for Ishtar, and I approached it as writing you know, two characters that I was playing, you know, Chuck and Lyle, who are totally mismatched songwriters, and to write believable songs that sound like they come out of two almost professional songwriters who are pretty good and then they just screw it up. Uh, telling the truth can be dangerous business. Honest and popular don't go hand in hand. If you admit that you can play the accordion, no one will hire you in a rock and roll band. I mean, it's just, she said, come look, there's a wardrobe of love in my eyes. Take your time, look around, try to find something your size. I mean, they're bad, but there was, they were accurate to the characters. So uh, 
at this point, I don't even remember what the, the question was, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that acting and, and writing, you know, for, for any, any production, they, they're, they're in many ways the same thing for me. All right, well, thank, thank you very you. much, and thanks again for coming out. You guys are fabulous. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, And that brings us to Saturday morning. Tom has now joined me, and we are taking our first steps onto the convention floor. Welcome to Saturday morning Cincinnati Comic Expo. Once a year, Tom and I get down here, and we're very excited to be down here once again. Very much so. Uh, it's going to be exciting. I got a little sneak preview because I came down Friday night. Little someone, jealous. Little yeah, jealous. I, I, well, I wanted to get the Paul Williams Q and A. They well, put him on a Friday. And you went to Brent Spiner. I always love seeing I, Brent. I did manage to get there. I got there. He was running just a few minutes late, and oh. I was able to. I got to the room at like at five o'clock, and he came on maybe five minutes later or whatever. And then actually surprised me or surprised everybody because they didn't actually introduce him. He just suddenly came out on stage and started talking. And I'm, I wasn't even looking at the stage. And suddenly, you know, you hear, oh, a famous man of stage. You're like, what? Oh, oh, that's Brent. Oh. <laughs> hey, self-introduction. You got to yeah. like it. it was, his was not moderated. So it was just a one-man show. Um, Great. Apparently, he was told there was going to be a moderator. Yep. There was no moderator. There was no moderator. Fridays at the Comic Expo, I get the impression, are pretty chill. And not everybody knows exactly what's the, going on. The... The act is not fully pulled together yet. Uh, no. The moderator was probably caught in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> That's very... Uh, considering how long it actually took me to get down here, yeah. when I was already halfway here, because I left straight from work, I, I mean, uh, and how long it took, I believe it. I was super late. I mean, it took me eight hours. Yeah. So. See? There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, so the 2023 Come to Expo... Uh, Again, another a big list of celebs. A few of them have already, unfortunately, had to cancel uh, a yeah. little late. I know one you were, you'd mentioned um, uh, 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 Tara Strong. Yeah. Um, she apparently was down with a virus, oh. and so she had to cancel. Oh, she had to cancel. That's a shame. Uh, just a couple of days prior. So okay. That's, uh, I think she was holding off as long as she could. I was a little confused by Facebook. They kept saying that she was still coming, so I missed the, entirely that she had to cancel. Yeah, it was only just a couple days ago. Okay. Well, that's a shame. But uh, we got a, a Paul Bettany, who we just saw in the movie Priest. <laughs> uh, you know, or might try to catch him. I don't know. Do we, do we want to try to ask him about that? Uh, he'd probably prefer we not. But, <laughs> but uh, given the strike, that might be the one he's allowed to talk about. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, that is going to be very curious. The Q and A's that we do sit in because I, I did get a taste of that yesterday, especially with Brent Spiner. Yeah, he's not allowed to talk about much. Yeah, so I assume the best part of having him here would have been to have conversations about this last season of Picard, and you probably couldn't talk to him about the last season of Picard. <laughs> yeah, he can't. He can't talk about that stuff. So yeah. I mean, he, he had a lot to talk about. He could talk about his stage work. He sure. could talk about just the industry in general and his his life and 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 he yeah, writes he, some of his own stuff. Uh, he talked yeah. about his music. Uh, the, apparently, him and Jonathan Frakes are putting together like a sort of a reality show. Oh, really? <laughs> oh my God! Where they're going to do kind of like wish fulfillment sort of thing? They said it's it's an early stage and you don't know exactly you know, but apparently you can call, you can email them and get them to come out and help you do stuff. He's like, I don't mean like build a house or <laughs> anything like that, but if you want to. Uh, you know, introduce somebody, or if you want to surprise someone, you know, that kind yeah, of yeah. thing. Okay. So that'll be interesting to see what comes. I don't know if it's going to be anything that's actually going to air, or if it's just going to be like a web series, but... Yeah, I see that. I'd have a hard time. I, I'm not a big fan of reality shows, but I'm going to have to enter a tape for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> just I, to hang out with Brent and, oh, and Jonathan. Yeah, I'm more I would like to actually have like a good half an hour talking with Jonathan Frakes, Brent well, Spiner, I, I yeah, take or leave, but... <laughs> Well, we've seen Brent on a number of occasions. I don't think I've ever seen Jonathan Frakes at, at an event. I, I, not the one that I've been I've to. been at events where he's at, but I've never caught like a and a with him or anything. Oh. And I've never had an opportunity to actually talk to him. So. No, I, I, these days he he is Star Trek, so Star Trek doesn't exist without him very much. Yeah, exactly. So who else we got coming down here the, this weekend that you're kind of looking forward to seeing? Uh, big fan of Adam Savage. Looking forward to seeing him. Uh 
Uh, and then, uh, man, there's a lot. Uh, I know there was a lot of the voice actors from yeah. like the Star Trek or the Star Wars animated. I'm going to butcher her name, but Ecclestein, I think. Uh, yeah, she's the voice of Ahsoka. I'm um, really hoping to catch her. So yeah, yeah. I think they're doing an actual uh, like multi uh, celeb panel. So there'll be like three or four of them all. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, looking we'll, forward we'll to ma- these. We'll make sure and catch that this afternoon. Yep. Yeah. No, we got yeah, we got to dig up the schedule because they've not done a great job with uh, where to find the schedule these days. Well, it it's did been, they improve it? It's been corrected. The website was corrected. The oh, website okay, for uh, the longest time was directing you to last year's. <laughs> yes, it was as uh, of last week. Yeah, no, it, it is. Uh, they they did not do an app this year, but they do have it. Uh, you know, a uh, an actual web page that you can bookmark to like your home screen. And so you can just pull it up, and your, the schedule pops right up. So it is there, and it is the current schedule. Yeah, no, and th- this will be extra entertaining since they have kind of a new configuration this year. Very new. Um, and then you add on, this is the last time in here for a little while. So yeah, we'll have to soak up as much as we can. Yeah, I, I didn't walk the whole floor last night. I just kind of did a, just around the edge, just sure. a quick shot through. And I went back and talked to a, my friend Barry back there with the uh, the Star Wars. Mm-hmm. He did the, doing the, uh, the trench run, the, yep, the Star trench, trench run. run. Yep. And I, I spoke to him for a few minutes last night. And so I got to just kind of a, a, a basic feel for the floor and the layout i think is a much more open which is nice i'm curious to see when they actually let everybody in what that and how that works out but it does feel like there's a little bit more room in the aisles yeah no uh, it's the first thing that struck me because uh everything seemed compacted in last year and and it does it's it's got a wider open feel so hopefully that makes for a nice flow yeah i, I don't know if that's just by uh, the layout design or if they have less vendors or... i actually wonder if it has even more to do with the uh cosplay continues to get more and more elaborate things get bigger and bigger <laughs> give a room to move yeah hey, all of a sudden you'll see like a full mech walk through here and you're going to need a little room to maneuver <laughs> i think one of the things i'd kind of like to uh I, I mean every year we like to find that one vendor that one artist that one booth oh, yeah. that we you know something unique uh, something exactly. not just reselling everything that you can get on amazon i think i'd actually like to try to talk to maybe some of the uh the fan groups that come down okay uh, yeah. you know uh, the 501st is always the, the most popular and the famous you know oh, everybody yeah, yeah, knows yeah, about yeah. It. but there's some smaller ones too like you know there's the, the the cincinnati ghostbusters you know like what are they all about and that sort of thing no, uh, that'd be fun to catch some of them, uh, hear about the, the kind of work that they do aside from just dressing up and uh, entertaining. Yeah, yeah. So it should give be a, uh, a it should be a good weekend. I think we should go ahead and maybe start wandering around before the uh, the main gates open, so uh, we oh, yeah. enjoy the open space for a little <laughs> while, and uh, we'll see what we can what kind of trouble we can get into. As long as nobody crosses the magic tape in the line. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, we'll be back soon, people. Now, soon thereafter, we stopped at a booth and talked to the folks selling a brand new game called The Game of Ham. Yep, The Game of Ham. Not exactly what you might expect by the the title, but this is sort of a Cards Against Humanity, but darker and more twisted. Uh, It sounds like it's a lot of fun, and the guy, he knew how to pitch, and it was great. Uh, But it didn't record. And I only bring this up because we mentioned this game a couple times in future recordings, so I wanted to make sure to drop in and let you know that what happened to this recording. I really recommend running to gameofham.com and check this thing out. It looks like it would be fantastic. So, yes, go, go check out gameofham.com. And, uh, and with that, believe it or not, it's lunchtime at the expo. Tom and I didn't have any Q and A's to go to in the morning, so we just sat down and uh, had a little lunch. And yes, we do indeed talk about Game of Ham. All right, taking an early lunch at the expo. We've had a chance to walk around a little bit. We've met a few people. Uh, some fun cosplay. We've got some photos. Uh, follow the link in the show notes to all the social media. You'll see some photos and stuff from the cosplay. 
And uh, yeah, and you should be. Uh, Never mind, you're hearing this, so you're gonna, definitely <laughs> going to hear the recordings that we've already done with uh, some of the booths. Um, the uh, the ham game the, of ham. Game of ham was a lot of fun. Yeah, those are the. He definitely has his pitch down. He does. Been working on it. It's fun watching him with his daughter there. Uh, <laughs> Was that, do you think that was his daughter? Did he say it? I think that's what he said. Uh, mm. That was his daughter. Um, I don't know. Refer back to the recording. I, we yeah, might have yeah. caught that. But yeah, but yeah no, the, the game, the, the, it's actually very well thought out. Uh, it looked like a lot of fun. Um, even at the convention price of $100, though? At the well, end. I think the game, the, the, the base was 50 Oh, was it? Yeah, and I think you can get some all the big extensions and, and expansions and stuff, and then that 100 150 something like that. But I think the base game was 50 bucks. We may have to go back. That might be my splurge for this weekend, because that actually, seriously, that looked like a lot of fun. I could see you getting together with your friends and everything and playing something like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So There's one, uh, Matt, if he comes down, should... Uh, should see that for one of his game nights, I think. There you go. So, Matt, if you're listening, if you didn't come down this year, gameofham.com, check it out. Definitely. We we met a lovely young woman who was uh, peddling uh, Pedro Pascal stuff. Pillows and bags and sheets. Yeah. Yeah, no. It was very pink. <laughs> yes, and Tom is a little enamored with the salesperson. She's cute. She's nerdy. What's... What What's not the wrong? like, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what do you think of the new layout? I like the wider open floor plan. It is making navigating a lot easier. Um, Mostly. But it's funny, um, each year, year over year, you can see how trends ebb and flow. Um, every uh, Like this year, every other booth seems like they're selling... Um, lightsabers um lego minifigs and variations on those are, are very popular again i mean not that they ever stop being popular right. but there i saw f- at least five booths devoted to that so the thing i'm uh, finding uh, a little bit of drawback i'm not seeing a lot of like personal artwork stuff like yet yeah, we have the the artist row where people are uh, making their own books and their own drawings and stuff like that. But I haven't seen anything unique yet. You know, and that's something I remember commenting uh, when I went to the Indiana Comic Con and I was going through their stuff. And I think I mentioned it on the show uh, when I was talking about it. You'd stop at a booth and go, oh, that's a really good piece of artwork at the Enterprise. Yeah. And then you go to the next booth and Oh, that's a really, really good, good interesting uh, art of the Enterprise. Enterprise yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's just reproduction upon reproduction of the same thing. So trying... Well, it's at least, you know, a different interpretation. Sure. It's not like the exact same thing or anything, but it's just... Yeah, you're looking for that one standout. And, I, yeah, I, I'm not seeing the standouts. Yeah, like the past couple of years, there's a guy that made... Um, uh, wire art, like he made wire yeah, sculptures, I seen him and this he year, doesn't yeah. appear to be here this year. Um, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. Uh, there was the uh, there was the booth where they were m- making custom fabric, um, like dolls and things. It's where I actually picked up a headless horseman where the uh, pumpkin oh, right. head snapped on top, which yeah. was super cool. Uh, I haven't seen a booth like that, so I did see the uh, the guy that makes the uh, the art from Metal Junk, you know, nuts, bolts. Oh, did you? Gears. I missed him. Yeah. yeah, no, he's stuck in a very small little nook, but he is here. So, but yeah, I, I like coming and finding those things, and this brought us to the the quick little debate we had about three um, D printing and. And uh, anyone that uses, like, laser cutting tools to make their work, I get that those things are handy for for mass production purposes, but is it an individual art? Right. And it, it, I question whether or not it is. As you pointed out, you said you saw some, there was a woodcut, mm-hmm. it was a woodcut of a comic book cover. Right. 
Now, they uh, they chose what they chose to color versus not color, leaving in wood tone. So there were some creative choices in it, but you can easily scan that or grab an image off online, uh, trace it, and then program that into your laser etching right. tool. So does is that art... Or is that just a reproduction in a different medium? Right, yeah, interesting. And it's it lends to the thing that you can now kind of do all this stuff at home. Yeah. So are you paying for the convenience of not having to actually buy the equipment and doing it yourself? Yeah, the equipment, uh, the supplies, because, yeah, even in 3D printing, getting, um, getting the resin that goes through the uh, machines, that's... That can be pricey, so if you want one thing and you don't want to go through the trouble of going to your local library, <laughs> then sure, maybe it's worth it to buy it, but is it art? Yeah. Don't know. Yeah, the 3D print is the one that's really got me, because you just don't know, did they create the uh, the design themselves before right. they printed it, or did they download or buy it online and they just oh but i i did this one in blue right uh yeah that's the one that's really got me i and i told you as we were walking by i feel like that starts falling into that same uh, we're, we're dealing this now with ai mm-hmm. or an ai uh writing and uh i think it kind of falls in that same yeah is that legitimate yeah is Having the idea to proceed enough to make it your own. Right. Like, even in the AI stuff, you have to put in all the parameters. But, I mean, you didn't really see the vision of it. You let the computer do it from there. In these cases, the 3D printer... Um, now, if you did build the uh, the actual um, file that it will print from, and you did that, then I... Yeah, I put that fully... You just, this was your medium to get that vision out. But if you didn't need, if your vision was, oh, I wanted one and I found it online and I printed it out, that 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 doesn't necessarily constitute art for me. <laughs> or, let me ask you this, what do you think? It's something like uh, Star Wars theme, say, because mm-hmm. that's popular. Yeah. So they have a 3D printed uh, droid, an R2, or a, mm-hmm. an X-Wing. Yeah, did they create that? Is that theirs to sell? Uh, and well, one, yeah, you get into a big. Uh, is it theirs to sell? Mm-hmm. Um, George Lucas might have thoughts on that. Um, and I, I, I don't claim to know everything about trademark and copyright. So, but did you do anything to make it your own in some fa- fashion? Because that's a big part of. Uh, the comic book world too is you can take something from a theme and make it your own every artist that's ever done batman has made batman their version of batman so yes i believe you can take a pop culture icon and add something to it and make it your own but are is that what they're doing you'd almost have to drill down into talking to them more about so where did this come from? Did you create something? You'd have to really get into that to yeah. know what I mean, you're buying. Conventions have always been sort of the, the, the gray market when it comes to oh, selling yeah. merchandise. I, we've all, back in the day, bought bootleg videos. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and stuff like that. And, yeah, we all knew this wasn't officially licensed copy of X movie or whatever. Granted, some of that stuff at the time couldn't be found anywhere else true uh so are we just kind of becoming more aware of how not gray you know it is because of all the uh the news and everything that's going on about ai and you know, the the sag act or the, the strikes and yep. everything that's going on right now so are we walking here we kind of seeing this and going yeah now i'm feeling a little guilty for <laughs> it's like all the things from uh, from history uh that they were a good idea at the time until you learn more about where where it all comes from and why it all got to be the way it is. And now we start getting this itchier feeling like, okay, uh, 
this is not necessarily what I thought it was. <laughs> that is actually something I haven't seen here is the gray market DVDs. <laughs> Actually, yeah, now that you brought that up... Uh, uh, There's usually always somebody with just a small corner somewhere. Well, as I've had conversations outside of us uh, with some folks, um, vintage media is is very much a thing. It's a reason, it's a reason that albums, uh, actual records are a thing. I just um, found feathers on my chicken wing. Well, then you at least know it actually came from a chicken. Yeah, that is... <laughs> That is interesting. <laughs> Sorry, uh, didn't mean to der- that, derail you. That's a qu- quite the uh, segue there. Um, no, um, yeah, you did derail me. I, I forget which thread I was on now. Oh, the the vintage media. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually find it a little peculiar that we don't see at least somebody uh, with vintage video games because uh, I haven't actually seen that. No, good point. Uh, um, or vintage media. V- yeah, VHS. Like yeah. VHS. There are people that still like their VHS. Where's the laser disc market? Pocket. Yeah. And there is one. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, I mean, you don't, uh, there's no booth that's specializing in that. No. Well, where you usually find that stuff is just some corner of a table of one of the comic book booths. And either I've missed it or they haven't bothered this year. And... And that's very, very possible, very true. Uh, what I think I'm projecting is we might see in future iterations more rise in some of that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point you'll be able to leaf through some VHS tapes again one day. It's just, it's a niche thing and people get into it still. So, yeah, I'm thinking my uh, retirement plan is VHS repair. There you go. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe your your backlog of actual physical media could truly be worth something someday. You'll be uh, what? You'll be that? What it was? It the Burgess Meredith character in the library. <laughs> I, time enough at last. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. So far, it's been an interesting morning. Yep. Uh, we still got more to come. There's a couple. Uh, we're talking about uh, talking about some to the fan groups, and we got over there, and of course, <laughs> we got there just in time for him to actually be cosplaying <laughs> up and not been able to speak. So we'll try to catch him later this afternoon. Yeah, we want to visit with uh, the Ghostbusters of Ohio or Cincinnati. Cincinnati or Ghostbusters. Cincinnati yeah. Ghostbusters. And then, interestingly enough, like there were no panels that. Uh, that we were looking at for this morning. So. No, the first one's going to be coming up in about an hour and a half or so. Actually, 45 minutes. Okay. There you go. <laughs> From the time of recording. Yeah. So. But, but yeah, and all the guests the, uh, are really in the afternoon. That's the Clone Wars mm-hmm. highlight, right? Okay. Which is definitely more your thing. Definitely. But, uh, but and now I can say her name right, Ashley Exty. <laughs> We'll get to see her and Lantner. Um, We're going to get up there, and she's going to introduce herself as Janet Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because why not? The letters make me are com- sm- all the letters are silent. <laughs> <laughs> why not make me completely wrong? <laughs> I'm used to being wrong, but th- th- that would be totality. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that as we walk around, we will still find some more stuff that we will we have walked by and uh, didn't notice, and we'll we'll catch on the second pass. But we'll see how it goes because, like I said, this afternoon I think is going to be pretty busy with the panels, but uh, I think we'll still get a few breaks. Oh yeah, and then um, we have actually seen some decent cosplay already. Yes, we have wonderful uh, Mr. Freeze. That was very cool. Yeah, his uh, Mr. Freeze costume was very cool. I, I like it when they they put in some effort, kind of thing. Oh yeah, and that was all him. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and complete with you know the bowl over his head kind of thing and everything, to the point where we were talking to him and he was having a hard time hearing because he had a bowl over his head. <laughs> yeah, but he actually you could speak. He, he had a, a modulator. Yeah, and I thought that was very cool. So you could speak through it like Mr. Freeze. I yeah, like that. he just had a hard time hearing everybody. <laughs> yeah, it was well, well in a noisy convention floor. You know yeah. that'll happen. All right, well, more to come, folks. Okay, our first Q&A of the day was a spotlight on the Clone Wars, 
And appearing in this Q&A is Ashley Eckstein, Matt Lanter, and James Arnold Taylor, the voice actors behind Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka. Now, this was more for Tom. He watches the show. I don't watch the show, but I am so glad I sat in on this. It was really interesting. The three of them are so much fun. They have an incredible passion for Star Wars. They are truly fans of the franchise, and it really shows by hearing them talk. Now, this first bit I've got here is just them auditioning for the parts. The moderator asked about them walking in, and you know, two guys had to sort of recreate roles that had already been done by other actors. And, of course, Ashley, she got to do it all on her own with, a, with nothing to base it on. And everybody, everybody's approach and how they get, came to the roles are a lot of fun and really interesting. Yeah, I didn't know I was auditioning for Anakin. Oh, wow. Uh, James, uh, James just mentioned very secretive. They didn't tell me that. So when I went in, I knew it was a Star Wars project. They told me it was for a character, Geek Starkiller. And uh, I, I went in and I, I, read a, I read the copy, and the copy was a scene with R2, and Dave was in there. And he said, you know the character Han Solo and Luke Skywalker? I was like, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> he said, just do kind of a mashup of what you think that sounds like, and just go. That was my that was my instruction. That's it. And so uh, I, I did that, and I got the call, and they told me you're hired. It's for Anakin. And, he's a, and after you found out it was Anakin, did you go back and go, well, I kind of want to model it after him? Kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely went back and watched. Uh, there, there's a there's a sing songy way to Star Wars dialogue, and there's certainly a way uh, that Hayden delivers uh, a cadence, I should say. Um, but I, I didn't try to copy or mimic the way he sounded at all. Uh, I think they they didn't tell me because I think they wanted to hire someone who just came in and brought something fresh to the table, I guess. So um, I had a lot of freedom in that area. But uh, yeah, I certainly watched his, his performance. Yeah. And James, for you with Obi-Wan? Well, so my experience was a little different. It started back in uh, 2001 for the micro-series of the Clone Wars. Y'all remember the micro-series? <laughs> I was just joking, it took me longer to park my car and walk to the studio than it did to record the dialogue. I was like, that was Attica. Attica. All right, you're done. And I said, it was very short. But so at the time, the movies were still being made, so I needed to match you and actually pretty close, as close as I could. So, uh, because they were still making Revenge of the Sith, and then we did the Revenge of the Sith video game. And that was, there was a, a moment where they brought in uh, David Collins, who's a very talented voice actor and musician in his own right, was directing the game. And he brought in this laptop that was like, you know, handcuffed to him, and it was a blues, a blues line scene with, you know, Gregor, and he was saying, you know, you were the chosen one! You know, and, and it was the scene, and they said, can you match that? And I thought, oh, because he's doing something different, you know, and normally it's, oh, I have a bad feeling about this master. But then when he went up and, come to your senses, what would Pat May do if she was in your position? We had this kind of gruffness to it. And so they said, can you do that? And, and thankfully I could. And I've been Obi-Wan ever since. It's been going for 21, 22 years now. And um, I'm very blessed to be able to be a part of this world. And um, I'm very grateful. Follow the footsteps. How is that coming new? Yeah, so similar to Matt, I went in and I was auditioning for Padme. And um, I was super excited. I found out the night before I had my audition. Um, and I was super excited because I was a big Star Wars fan. But then I was devastated because I sounded nothing like Natalie Portman. <laughs> and I kept like, practicing and practicing all night. And, um, you know, I was really discouraged going into the audition. And I walked in, and at this point, you have to keep in mind, like, Matt and I actually were primarily on-camera actors in LA, and I so badly wanted to be a voice actor as well, but it didn't come easy to me. Um, I had been auditioning for about four years, which was about 400 auditions that I did not get. <laughs> um, in fact, I was even recast a couple times, where they cast you and then they change their mind, which is devastating. And so I was already feeling down on myself because I couldn't be a voice match to Natalie Portman. And I walked into the audition and um, every top voiceover actress in all of LA was in there. 
And so I actually walked out and I went to my car, I put the key in the ignition, I was literally, I turned it and I called my agent and I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry, but I don't have a chance at this. I, I'm actually gonna leave. And he, bet, and I'm actually a really positive person, but for that day I was just angry. I hadn't eaten all day. <laughs> and I was a little snippy. And, um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so he, he begged me, he said, Ashley, whatever you do, do not leave the audition. He goes, please turn around and go back in there because you never know what could happen. And I'm so glad I took it at his advice because I went back in, waited about an hour, went into audition for Padme, Dave Filoni stopped me after the first line and he was like, no, you sound too young to be Padme. But he walked in and they handed me these lines for this new character. They said, well, but there's a 14-year-old girl that's, that's new and we think you might be right for her. And so I ended up auditioning for Ahsoka, but I didn't know it was Ahsoka. Like Matt, I actually got the part and found out on my first day of work who I was actually playing. I just knew I had booked a 14-year-old girl and she was a new character, so. Um, Fortunately, uh, Dave Filoni cast me to just be me, to just be myself. So he didn't know what he wanted for the role. Um, originally, he wanted Ahsoka to have an Icelandic accent, which I could not do. <laughs> um, and when I, I couldn't do it, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a huge part of the story, but um, I, I raised my hand and he's like, I'm sorry, can you make it sound more Icelandic? And I thought I was like sounding Icelandic, so I raised my hand and I'm like, I'm sorry, I am doing Icelandic. I don't know what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and that got Which is not her. Which is not me. Yeah. You don't, if there's ever aspiring actors out there, don't talk back to the director. <laughs> Again, I was angry, I guess. Um, but that actually got me the part. Uh, because he wanted somebody to be snippy but not bratty. Yeah. And so when I showed up for my first day of work, he said, I don't want Icelandic. He goes, I want you to just be you. Bring your own voice, your own personality, your own humor, and your own heart to the character. And I feel very blessed that I got to do that. Now, speaking of auditioning, that question kind of came up a lot in these Q&As because so many of the actors really couldn't talk about the actual properties that they have been working on because of the uh, the ongoing strike. So when we sat in with uh, Julie Benz and Rebecca Gayhart on their Q&A, that was a question that came up. It was just tales from the audition. If I get signed on for that movie, have any, had any auditions gone really good or any bad, any good stories that come from auditioning? Or... I've had really bad auditions. I mean, I had one audition. It was for a very big film. And I walked in... And I, it was for the producer and this very famous director. And I maybe got like three lines out and the director was like, ugh, you remind me of my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and I was like, I guess I should just leave. Rude. Yeah. Yeah. Rude. Yeah. I had another audition with another famous person where his phone rang in the middle and he took the call. Oh. <laughs> and it was just like, he told me to keep going and I was like, uh, okay. And then another time where the casting director said, she introduced me and she said, and now we have Julie Bowen. Oh my God. And I was like, oh no, it's Julie Benz. Should I go? <laughs> Should I just leave? And she was like, oh, oh. No, no, it's fine. Since you're here, you can, I was like. <laughs> and you know, so much preparation goes into an audition. I think that is the thing people don't understand is that you get, a lot of scenes, a lot of pages you memorize and you work on and you work on a character. There's a lot of work involved that before yeah. an audition. You sit so, in traffic to get there, <laughs> wait, waiting room. Yeah, so if someone's not excited to give you your opportunity or your shot when you're there, it's pretty disappointing. Yeah. Um, what about you? I mean, I, yeah, I've had terrible auditions. It's the worst. Um, when you leave and you feel like crap, but then you get excited the next time you read a great script and you do it again because you love it. Um, for one of my movies that I can't talk about. Um, I think I screen tested five times. That was a little nerve wracking. And each time, you know, it was like there was four of us, then there was three of us, then there was two of us, and then you're just waiting to hear. And you know, it's, so it's, 
that part's not fun, yeah. but it's really fun when you get the call that you got the job. Yeah. So it's all worth it. Um, and then you get nervous again because then you have to do a table read and you can get fired at the table. Exactly. Read. And then you have to get through the first day of filming because you get fired after that. Because it's the first day of school, and that's really hard. Though every job is like the first day of school on the set. There's always nerves involved, but listen, we're so lucky that we get to do what we do. It's so fun, and um, you know, it's our, our creative outlet. I, and I, I miss it. I, I've taken a lot of time off to raise my kids. So I'm excited to get back into it. They opened up this Q&A to questions from the audience, so who would be the first person to raise their hand? Yeah, that'd be me. I'll ask about your convention experiences a little bit as a sort of a ten tangential, since you can't talk about the shows and stuff. You each start in a show that struggled to find maybe, seemed to struggle to find its fandom, uh, Defiance and Earth 2. And I think um, often celebrities, that they go to the conventions, they find oh, they had their fandoms and they could meet their fandoms. Has that been the experience for you guys? And have you enjoyed um, getting that from, from the, uh, the people who have come to talk to you at the tables and such? I mean, I've been involved in the convention world since back when it was like a dirty little secret that you didn't tell anybody about that you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> like over 20 years ago. Um, now it's everybody wants to be a part of this world. And I've always said from the very beginning, it was so great to be a part of a show where there was a global community around it. Um, where you can go in the world, like anywhere in the world, and there are fans that come together. And I've seen some, I've seen fans meet each other, fall in love, get married, have babies over the years, like, and there's only certain types of shows that bring people together like that. And so for me, it's always been like, the icing on the cake of what we do. Um, and on a, you know, a very popular previous show that I was a part of, <laughs> um, I used to say about the fan base, it was so great to be a part of a show where the fans are just as passionate about the show as we were making it, um, to have that dual passion happen. So it's been fantastic. Now with the show that you mentioned that I was in, we, that was when Twitter was uh, good. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. And we utilized the fan base on Twitter a lot. And that was, um, I'm, I'm going to brag, that was my idea. Um, and we enlisted uh, the rest of the cast as well as the fans to watch while we live tweeted. And we even enlisted, um, there were some really smart, funny, intelligent fans that were so snarky and so fun about the show, because the show lent itself to that, that um, at Dragon Con, I did an event with them and met everybody face to face, but I felt like I knew them all. Like I felt like we were, and now we're still friends. Like we, we all became friends and, and, um, and they created some amazing fan art for that show. And it was really, it, it was incredible to be in that specific, to have a, a show that lent itself to that on Twitter when Twitter was good and have that immediate, um, it was basically like having a fan convention every week. And it was so rewarding for everybody involved. I think that the crew got into it, the cast, like everybody was so into you know, live tweeting our shows. And it was so much fun. Well, unlike Julie, I'm new to conventions. But I brought her here. Yep. Thanks to Julie. I'm here. Thank you so much. And it's, it's been great. Um, it's my third one. Um, but back to Earth 2, well, that show that you mentioned. <laughs> um, yes. Um, wow, this is so hard. Um, it was before its time, in my opinion. And um, it just, listen, any show with Tim Curry should be a hit, right? And Steven Spielberg, right? It was pretty great Steven Spielberg. Tim Curry was, a, it was such a great program. And it was just a little bit before its time. So it is fun to see people who appreciated that show because there was a lot of, it was a lot of hard work and it was actually a really great production. Um, so that is nice. It's it's nice to meet all the fans at the conventions. I think the conventions are, like you said, it's a great way to sort of gauge what shows touch people um, and really resonated with the world. 
you know? So it's a great touchstone. It's really fun to reunite with fellow thespians and directors and um, in this way. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we can hear. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Hey, it's nice and busy. You guys are today. in a very, like the spot, the sound here is very. Right. Yeah. All right, we are recording. Okay, we're on the floor again, and we decided to talk to some of the fan communities here. And we are here, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart because I am a huge Ghostbusters fan. So I'm talking with Scott yes. of Cincinnati Ghostbusters. Yep. Scott, thanks for talking with me. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, no problem. So tell us a little bit about your organization here. So, our organization, we use the fandom of Ghostbusters and bring joy to everybody. And we also raise money for Make-A-Wish and do collections for Toys for Tots. And we go around and do this throughout the whole tri-state. Excellent. Now, of course, as far as um, kind of like the, the, the cosplay groups for charity, the 501st is awfully kind of the one that springs to everyone's mind first. Right. Uh, they've been around forever now and everything. What about the ghost, the Ghostbusters kind of cosplay fandom? I've seen them in other towns as well and everything. Is it a national or is it just a group of locals? It's all around the world. Yeah? Oh, wow. Okay. So there's franchises in different cities okay. and different states and in different countries. And we all use the fandom to... So you have kind of a network and a structure that you work from? Yep. That's yep. awesome. And we got, me and my daughter, we got into it about five years ago. And we joined with the real Ohio Ghostbusters, which is up in Dayton. Okay. And then with me being in Cincinnati, mm-hmm. people wanting to be members and stuff like that. So me and my daughter started Cincinnati Ghostbusters last year. So we're a 501 um, nonprofit. Excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. And you get to be a family affair, and do it too. Exactly. That makes a lot of fun. You get to spend some quality time with your dad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She loves it. Excited, great. Right, right. (laughs) And was it just your own personal fandom for Ghostbusters that? How did you discover the network in the first place? We started. She she liked Ghostbusters, and we started getting into it. So I built a pack, and then I built her a pack, and then we went to Kings Island. So we go to Kings Island. We didn't even make it ten steps into Kings Island, and people were like, "Oh, can we get a picture? We love it." Blah blah blah, and. I'll never forget it. This guy was probably my age, and he comes up and he's like, I love Ghostbusters, can I get a picture? And I took my wand off and I handed it to him, and he just turned into a five-year-old. <laughs> and I was like, this is something. Yeah. And then that's when I found that they have groups everywhere. So I'm like, so we joined the Real Ohio Ghostbusters, and we partnered with them, and then we started our own, and we still partner with everybody, whether it be Cincinnati, uh, Dayton, Toledo, Columbus, you know, right? We've gone to Chicago. Yeah, what are some of the other, uh, like obviously you're here at Comic Expo, what are some of the other events that you make? Um, we've done, we've done several affairs at the Florence Mall. Okay. Um, we do um, comics to games. Okay. We partner with them, we partner with IDS Entertainment in the mall, and then we reach out to other businesses and try and partner with them too excellent that's very cool yeah, i was going to ask what sort of um outreaches and then what do you do you said you you, you make money for like make a wish and, 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 and charities and everything but what other actual um is there any like specific events that you would then or is it are you invited or how, how does it work and it, more and more people are starting to reach out to us and ask us to attend mm-hmm. which we've been doing those and like right now we're real busy on trunk or treats so like we did a touch a truck event on Thursday and then we came in here you know for this weekend and then we're going to be doing um, a Ghostbuster event in Miamisburg where we're showing all the Ghostbuster movies nice we're collecting money for the whole day great so and then we do like horror hound conventions we do that in March in September sure so we're we're getting more and more busy excellent it seems like every weekend we're doing something And this is our second year at the comic, this comic expo. Excellent. And it's been good. Good, good. 
good. We're, we're trying to get our car in here. Is it? They're like, ah, we ain't got no room. Oh, I'm like, ah. is it for the car? So you've got your you've got your own ectomobile. <laughs> yes, yes, it's an Audi. <laughs> it's a it's a Bosch ectomobile. Yeah. It's good on gas. Inspired inspired by Ecto right, One. Right. Hey, the franchises are getting whatever vehicle That's they right. can. That's right. That's right. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's got the lights and the siren, sure. and it draws attention. Yeah, okay. That's what we it need. Absolutely does. <laughs> Well, you said you mentioned you built a pack. You built a couple packs. So uh, we're looking at them now. We'll definitely get some pictures of these things. This is Nick's Proton Pack. It's got all the lights and si- uh, sounds. It's a, it's a fiberglass shell uh, with aluminum, uh, resin, uh, wood, brass fittings. Some of the stuff's 3D printed. Some of the stuff is original, like the clippered valves. Um, the hoses are all natural uh, pneumatic hosing, um, so it's kind of a cobble Franken pack of a bunch of different different uh, areas, different media. Uh, I kind of feel like that's pretty good for a proton pack. That's, that's <laughs> why I think that's what the proton packs were anyway, right? Yes, yes. And this one does weigh almost exactly what the same ones uh, in the '84 film weighed. So if you put that on and like take a few steps, you'll know what what all the guys were feeling like. <laughs> and having done that for a while. I empathize with them greatly. Now, is there actual like blueprints that you can find, or is it do you do you recreate it just based on photos? Or so there are multiple ways to go about it. Um, some people make the shells out of fiberglass. Uh, some people three D print the different parts of the shell. Um, some people will assemble it out of uh, PVC foam, like all kinds of different stuff. There are blueprints online. Um, the debate on their each one's accuracy is always up for you know contradictions. Um, um, this one is all fiberglass. I bought it from a group, and um, it's a it's an online fan group, uh, GBFans.com. They're the largest uh, Ghostbusters fans. I bought the shell from them. Different parts came from other things. So, like, you know, this this was 3D printed in uh, in England. Um, you know, this this was machined in the United States, and I got it from somebody else who was just selling an extra one. So, you know, it's it's literally. A bit of everything, and I think that's what makes everybody's pack like unique. National culture, sure. Yeah. yeah, it's everyone's. Everyone's pack is their own pack. It all has their own little signatures to it. it. It's very cool. You can now also get Hasbro to sell you one. Well, so those were limited edition. Right. You had to be one of the backers and pre-order one, and they only yeah, made about fourteen thousand of them, I think. Well, we got one that, that we're, we're raffling off. this off on October fourteenth. That's oh, the nice. Hasbro one. Or might have to get around. Yeah, yeah. You better jump on it. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's ready to go. Nice. I see when you bought the when you bought the hashlap pack, it was just the the pack. Right. It didn't come with the wand, the wand. And separate. it doesn't come with the Alice frame. Nice. You're getting, you're getting everything with that one. Oh, then, then I'm putting it, I'm, I'm putting in for that now. Excellent. Everybody yes. very good. Back off. <laughs> and you're automatically a member. <laughs> Well, Scott, thank you very much for talking with us. Uh, Good luck. Have a fun time down here this weekend, and good luck with all your other endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, wait. Before we go, where can people go to to find and learn more about Cincinnati Ghostbusters? So you can follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Cincinnati Ghostbusters, or you can visit our website. It's um, CincinnatiGhostbusters.com. Excellent. There'll, There'll be links in the show notes, folks. Yes. We need to get an open battle between the 501st and the Ghostbusters. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Turn it into a huge right? opportunity. We'll bring Stapo out. There we yeah, go. go. Yeah. I think that's when you win. <laughs> yes, yes. The last Q&A that we sat in was uh, late in the afternoon. They ended on a high note with Adam Savage. Now, I got to see him at Indiana Comic Con not that long ago. And uh, if you can go back and listen to that episode, I have a few excerpts from that one. Well, I got a few from this one, too. The questions are always so good from the audience. And he just came out and started ask, answering questions right away. There was no moderation. He just came out on the stage, said, line up, ask me anything. And this one early on was uh, someone asking about some of the, the big ideas in sci-fi. Well, I mean, I love what you're saying about sci-fi being a wonderful avenue to inject um, genuinely philosophical and political ideas into, in through narrative, in ways that don't feel politicized. 
I mean, what, look, Gene Roddenberry started it with Star Trek, right? Like, the, the, that beautiful utopian ethos that's baked in. Uh, Ron Moore did it with Battlestar Galactica. Uh, all of my beautiful friends on The Expanse did it with that great show. And I think Silo also is a lovely excursion into how messed up people can get. Um, I love the genre for that. I love that, I mean, actually we sort of took, took advantage of the same thing on Mythbusters because if we're going to be honest with each other, all of the science in Mythbusters happened at about the 65 to 70% mark in the episode. Uh, television's a five act structure uh, in, because that's how many things we have between commercial breaks. And it was usually act four where we did all the real science. And then the, the, the last act was the explosions to get you to stick around <laughs> so you watch those commercials. And that's exactly what science fiction is doing. Like, oh, here's some glossy things with buttons. Actually, a friend of mine, his girlfriend once gave him a laser pointer for Christmas. And he was like, how did you know? And she's like, don't you know about dudes? Just give them something shiny with a button. <laughs> Um, we are not just explorers and inventors, uh, but one of the way, the key ways in which, actually the key way in which we transfer the information about our inventions and our explorations. <coughs> it's a false construction, but it's the one we have and it's the one we use and it's beautiful. Um, I mean that it's a false construction because narrative can lead us to believe like we're getting to see bigger pictures and we are but we're still all going to ever ever get to see a tiny slice of the whole thing but as 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 a creature that that uses narrative to disseminate information i love i love that orthogonal way i mean also it happens with our kids too right like if you have more than one kid ooh, like one kid's super understandable and the other kid is a freaking mystery <laughs> And I have one of those, and I have to sort of interpret what I, the messages I get from him, like I say, orthogonal, at right angles to the right information, and you sort of surmise and ask, why did he ask it that way? I can't remember what your original question was, but thank you for that. And that, and that actually led into the next question someone came up and asked, and it was about Adam Sandwich getting to go to the, getting to, go to the Smithsonian and checking out the original filming model of the Starship uh, Enterprise. Being able to see the Enterprise at the Smithsonian was a completely rare experience. And actually getting to like shove flashlights in there and look around, I cannot believe it was built by technicians in the early 60s who, and then there's no droop after all of these years. There's no droop, there's no sag. Um, the thing that made me the happiest was that it was only ever made to be photographed across its starboard side. And that the details on the port side are trompeloid, they're hand-painted in. Uh, I, the two of the main modelers on that, John Goodson uh, and his partner, Kim Smith, are two of my close friends. I was actually, somebody came to my table yesterday with a Universal Greeley, which is this very specific plastic part from the Tamiya Anzio Annie model kit. And I once put one in a <coughs> rocket for space cowboys that then live action replicated. And so they took this model part that is like less than a quarter of inch in diameter and they made it a foot in diameter in the set and made us all laugh hysterically. Someone brought one to my table yesterday and I sent it to a bunch of my ILM buddies. <laughs> um, I think one of the things I love most about seeing it though is feeling that singular Star Trek is a really unique thing in that that original series just has such a particular flavor to it, such a particular kind of real cohesive thing, and the ship felt like all of that in one. It felt, it wasn't like, oh, I'm looking at an outlier or a piece of this thing. Like, everything about Roddenberry's love of humanity and desire for inclusivity and allowing everyone to be themselves, all of that feels like it's there in that object. Now I'm most likely rejected. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. As you said, right. There is so much more in these Q&As, I just can't share it all. That, that wouldn't be right to the expo or the celebs. You need to go see these things for yourself. If you've never come down to the Cincinnati Comic Expo, do yourself a favor. Make 2024 the year that you do. 
It's going to be fun. I guarantee it. There's going to be, I guarantee you there's going to be fun guests, and I guarantee you'll have a fun time if you sit in on the Q&As. You're, all right. you're working, man. Exactly. We got it. Hey, right, man, yeah. we got, this animation ain't yeah. cheap. Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. All right, there is a new superhero in town here at the Comet Expo, and we're going to learn all about it. Introduce I, yourself. How absolutely. Are you? What's going on, man? My name is Jay the Teller. I am the head writer, CEO, and creator of Two Land Comics. This is our brand new superhero. His name is Drip. Drip is actually an acronym. It stands for Do Right, Inspire People, Something Creative and Unique. As I take this superhero, we actually go to schools all across the country. We do anti-bullying assemblies with our superheroes. So everything that you find in our graphic novel is going to be an amazing superhero storyline that follows a teenager who's trying to figure out how to see handle the responsibilities, the accountability of being being the protector, but also being the friend, the, the the son, and also the student at the same time. Something that's going to be unique about our issues is that we like to try to go back to the day where superheroes had uh, storylines and positive messages that they would massage in, not to the point where it uh, overshadows the IP, but to the point where, hey, anybody who's reading it, they're going to leave an issue in a better state of mind than they were before they started reading the issue. And so that's very, very important to us. I remember once upon a time where a father and a son could read the same comic book, could watch the same cartoon, and both of them leave with a pleasurable experience. So that's what we're trying to hit. Uh, again, this is Drip. Stands for Do Right, Inspire People. He is the flagship superhero to Tulane Comics. However, he is not the exclusive superhero to Tulane Comics, as we have a lot of things in the work, including our animated series, our graphic novels, and our soon-to-come toy line. So we're nice. working as hard as we can, and uh, hopefully the people like it and support it. Excellent. Thank you. That is it is awesome, and I, I love the uh, the inspirational message that you were talking about that you're incorporating in it. And anti bullying is incredibly important. And where sometimes I think comics can often be all about the violence kind of thing, you're putting in a positive message. That, like you know, you have a superhero that maybe he's got these extraordinary powers or whatever, but he's truly using them to better people. That, that that's the hope. That's the goal. I, I think we um we get to a point in uh, and this is a little. Uh, comic book psychology where I feel like while I think it's important to display humanity I, I, I've always felt like we missed the mark as far as society is concerned where we highlight humanity over hope um, in my opinion if I want to see humanity in all its ruthlessness I'll just turn on the news right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 just, just me just, just me I'm not highly interested, and I don't really get geeked up off of seeing the fallibility of man. Right. However, if, if, if we can highlight hope in it, and I leave it here in a better place than I was when I entered, just, just for what Tulane Comics and our mission statement and what our vision, no shot, no shade to anybody else, but what we hope to accomplish is, is, is cultivating that sort of community. So we'll see what happens. You're, you're, you're trying to show what humanity could be. If they put their the, the effort into Isn't it. that the goal, though? Yes. It is the goal. Absolutely. Seriously. It is Like, the isn't goal. that the goal? Right. Who wakes up? It's like, yo, <laughs> here's the limits to what I could do. Let me just, you, you know let, what I'm Let saying? me bump up against that, but never go above. You know, let me celebrate how Mediocre distraught. I can be. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, to me, like, what are we doing? And right. so, I, I don't know. I My mind, my mind, I don't really identify with that. Um, and so, and again... I don't want to. I don't want to sound elitist right now, as if oh, my vision is the best vision, because it's not. There is something for everyone, but I do believe that there is a community and there is a demographic of people who kind of want to return to that once upon a time where our superheroes were superheroes right, and yeah. our villains were villains, yeah. and there wasn't all this. Oh, he's the gray. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I, 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 I'm hoping that we can we can get there, yeah. and I'm hoping that people like it and want to support it kind of like going back to the old Superman but erasing some of the nationalism that kind of came with him. I'm not, I'm not even touching it. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, said, I'm, the man uh, said he's not throwing shade on it. I, right. I, I don't. So <laughs> here's what I'll say. There is a comic book for everyone. Oh, right. Absolutely. And, and what I know is that there is a demographic and a community of people who are like, hey, I want my superheroes to be superheroes. I want my villains to be villains. I enjoy that. It entertains me. I celebrate that. And that's where I want to escape. And for that community, we want to create a product for them. I think it's fantastic. And I think comics are a great way to introduce those kind of uh, lessons and stuff to kids. Uh, you, you can sit there and 
berate into the kids and try to drill it into their heads yeah. and everything. Yeah. But you give them something like a comic book, something with the pictures. It's but here's, here's you know, the thing, here's the thing. Not to get too psychologically deep right now, but let us not make the mistake of only believing that morality is exclusively for kids. Mm-hmm. Something has happened in America oh, yeah. where the moment that you say, oh man, this has positivity in it, adults say, oh well, that's not for us. Right. <laughs> we don't need the positive stuff. That's only for the kids. And so psychologically, I think it's healthy for us to get to a point where, of course, there are some uh, IPs that are more appropriate for kids, Barney, Sesame Street, etc. But simply because something highlights morality, we shouldn't relegate it to, oh, that's just for the little kid because we're adults and we don't need morality. No, we, we can't make that mistake. There, there is a lot of us that need to go back to kindergarten to learn how to share. That part. <laughs> that part. Yeah. Look, look, we look at the news and we see a lot of adults where it's like, hey, you need to be reminded about the fundamentals of society yeah. and healthy social living. Mm-hmm. And so um, and so that's that's always the line because a lot of times people hear, oh, this, is, this has positivity in it. Oh, let me just get this for my child. But don't forget, yeah. if we go back Maybe. to the 30s, if we go back to the 40s, we're super Superman was, oh, yeah. you know, it was grown adults yeah. watching Superman save a cat from a tree. <laughs> that wasn't exclusively for kids. So let's not evolve so much as a society where we like, oh, morality is just for kids. Yeah. How, about, how about sitting down and reading together? Yeah. yeah. What, what is that? Yeah. What is that? Uh, troops during World War II read that stuff because they needed the hope. 100%. So anyway, I got to get back to Hustle Mode, guys. You do that. Where can people find out more about it? TwoLandComics.com TwoLandComics.com The number two, not not T-W-O, not T-O-O, the number two, (laughs) L-A-N-D-C-O-M-I-C-S.com Excellent. Uh, There'll be a link in the show. That's going to do it from the expo. Here's Tom and I ending pretty much right where we started. All right, that is it. We are going to put a pin in another <laughs> Cincinnati Comic Expo. What do you think of 2023? Uh, not too bad. Uh, I love the, the new layout. I love the wider, uh, more open feel of it. Yeah. Um, we saw some good stuff. It was all a little uh, hamstrung a little bit by the, uh, the current strike. Uh, but I think a lot of them worked around... Uh, the conversation well enough that uh, if anything we might have gotten stories we wouldn't have uh, otherwise you know it actually it eliminated those and we've we've talked about it before that there's yeah. always those uh, why in your why in episode two you know <laughs> the, the galaxy quest uh, questions yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it avoided all of that yes and it kept it down to more of the the art of acting and yeah. just the um the experiences on set without actually going into the minutia of the roles or the series or the film. And, and what I enjoyed, uh, like I really enjoyed the panel with Adam Savage. And I didn't know what to expect because I, I hadn't actually seen him speak before. And since he's not really, like he's tied to Tested, yes. Um, and then there's his Mythbuster stuff. But I mean... He's got a broad, and he's as much a fan as he is an actual personality to go see. So the questions that even came up during his panel were very thoughtful, and his responses were amazing. Yeah, no, absolutely. But he's somebody, too, that, honestly, if you had all day to sit there and talk to him or whatever, right. you could probably go in and ask him, you could ask him about a television show or a movie. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, like we could have asked... Whether he the, had anything to do with it or not. Right, he's exactly. going to talk about it. Yeah, no, like, seriously, you could take all the questions that would have gone into any other panel, asked him, and he'd have had an opinion on them, and that would have been so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I do like the uh, the wider layout. Uh, they stagger the aisles a little bit, so it's hard to, like, do a pattern without having to go back over, which is... That's a quibble, I, I know, but... It's a quibble. It might also be partly a strategy. <laughs> it's true. I mean, these people are here to sell stuff. They want you to walk by, and then they want you to walk by again until until you actually make a decision whether or not you're going to go in or going to buy something. So. Yeah. And buy something you did. I did. I did. Uh, we talked to our, our friends at Game of Ham, and I picked up one of the boxes... Uh, 
I, I couldn't resist. It looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, I think you're having going to have a good time with that. And you'll have to, the first time you get a chance to play that with all your friends, you'll have to <laughs> give us a report. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a matter of finding the right environment because this is not a game for children. No, <laughs> yeah. maybe not one to sit down with your son. You're not going to, he's old enough. He's a teenager now. Yeah, he's a teenager, but he won't know a lot of these things. And, <laughs> and quite frankly, I don't know if I want to know if he knows a lot of these things. Uh, no, understood. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a learning experience for, for dad, I think, more than son. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, no, I, I enjoyed the Q&As we sat in. Uh, I, I like the ones where you sit in where you kind of go thinking, well, that might be interesting. And you end up having a lot of fun in it. Right, because you don't have a lot of exposure to Star Wars Clone Wars and all of that, and yeah. that panel was great. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Because, yeah. again, they could sit there and, you know, they couldn't talk in great details about a lot of things, but they could still talk about, you know, just voice acting and acting in general and, and their love for the uh, for Oh, Star no, Wars. In, in fact, when one of the people that got up uh, had a... a, a he was a little, a little winded about his question, but basically, how do I get, how do I get started? How do I get in there? And they had fantastic advice yeah. for him, which just applies across the board. If there's anything out there that you love that you want to do, understand you're not going to probably get to do that right away. But you get involved, you get yourself in the right environment, and you tell people, "Hey, this right. is what I want to do." That was amazing advice. Yeah, it was really good. It was really interesting. Uh, I, I like the Julie Benz and Rebecca Gayhart. Oh, band. yeah. And that was a little bit more intimate. It was a smaller crowd, smaller room and everything. Sure. And, and unfortunately, it started a little rocky at the, the beginning. Moderator was, the moderator, I feel like, was somebody that had absolutely no idea and had a cheat sheet on a on an index card. Yeah, it kind of felt like uh, he, he might not even entirely be sure who they are. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's <laughs> that the feel. I got. He could have been just nervous. I'll give a little room. But, uh, but yeah, once they got talking... And and they were actually fun, funnier about it because uh, they were trying to be truly hardcore. They wouldn't r- talk about even past yeah. stuff. They wouldn't, wouldn't even, say the names. Wouldn't even name, say the names of the properties. Right, right. yeah. So uh, they were fine letting the audience say the names, yeah. uh, but they right. would not utter them themselves. Yeah, are, you which, a SAG, are you a SAG card holder? No, you could say it. <laughs> which, 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 we, which we had a little fun with, too, because... Literally, the movie the two of them were in had the director sitting next to us. Yes. <laughs> Which, yes. that was not expected at all. No, no, the director of Jawbreaker was literally sitting right next to us. <laughs> so, them referencing him while they're saying, oh, you know, the movie that started with the letter J. <laughs> like, that was, that was fun. That was their nice little workaround on that. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was fun. It's been, a, it's been a good time. They... They seem to have a gift for bringing in some guests that even though you kind of go, well, that's not, you know, exactly A-list or anything. Right. They're fun and they're interesting. No, and actually, if anything, you learn a little something like uh, Rebecca Gayhart. Uh, I know her from her prior works. Um, but, yeah, she's been missing from the scene for a while. We learned that she took time out for her family. But we also learned she's looking to get back in. So I'll be yeah. curious uh, after the after the strikes are, have all passed and we move back into production on things. What will she show up in? Yeah, no, I'd, I'll be curious to see if she uh, you know finds her way back to some productions and maybe she'll start out doing some like independent films and stuff like that. Maybe the director of Jawbreaker was there to make number two. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're going to do it in the latter years. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, re, the jawbreaker, the reunion. Yeah, exactly. The, re, the high school reunion. There you go. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a lot of fun. And we, we ended up bumping into a couple of friends while we were down yep. here. Uh, we didn't get them on the recording, but Steve no. uh, showed up. We got a yep. chance to catch up with him just a little bit. And he had to run off some other friends that uh, was here for some photo op stuff. Uh, we bumped into Matt, a yep. uh, former co-host. He was down here with his wife, uh, checking a few things out. He bought the game of ham. He Not did. Surprised? Yeah. <laughs> uh, overall, yeah, it's been a it's been a fun day. It's been a good weekend. Yes. No. Uh, it was fun uh, talking with uh, some of the uh, folks that do the charity work stuff. Yes. Uh, is Cincinnati Ghostbusters. I really want that proton pack. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tom did indeed put in for the raffle for the proton pack, yes. so we shall see. And we got some really nice stickers and magnets out of it, so yeah. it's a good, definitely a good conversation. No, but it's uh, yeah, it sounds like a good organization, and uh, they're having fun doing what they do. 
I enjoyed uh, talking and hearing more about some of the independent comic and their uh, and their work. Uh, the the two land. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Two Land, uh, the, the positivity of what they're trying to put out yeah. in the world. And, I mean, not, you guys couldn't see it, but I mean, he had some uh, sample animation of the series mm-hmm. that they're trying to launch, and it looked really great. The toy line, oh, I agree yeah. that they were just prototypes, so obviously they're going to look really great, but they look good. I yeah, mean, no, those they're were like, solid characters. They remind me of, like, the old Todd McFarlane uh, detail kind of characters. Oh, yeah, no, they'll look amazing if they get them to production. Yeah, that would be very cool, and I, I wish them the best of luck. I think yep. that would be really awesome awesome if they kind of hit the ground and, and, and run. And if you're looking for something with your kids uh, that maybe you can share in the joy, maybe check them out. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that is going to wrap it up for this one. Uh, we've had a ball. Thank you again, Cincinnati Comic Expo. It, yes. It's been a blast. Yes. Looking forward to next year. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. See ya. All right. That's going to do it for this special episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please drop me a note if you went to the expo. Tell me what you saw. If you follow any of our social media accounts, you saw some photos with some fantastic cosplay. And I I know there's got to be, there's always tons that I miss. You know, you think you can take a picture of everybody and then you see someone else's photo and you're like, "Where, where the heck were they? How did I miss that? So follow the link in the show notes and all those photos will be up. Drop me a line. Let me know what you thought of Cincinnati Comic Expo or whatever conventions you're going to. I want to hear your stories. That's going to do it for this. We'll be back in about a week with a regular episode. So until then, we'll talk to you later. Bye.